Hi, and welcome to Boris in Wonderland, the show that takes you through the looking glass into the amazing world of the 3D internet. The show is broadcast live to the internet from IBM's Virtual Business Center in the virtual world of Second Life in front of a studio audience so you can hear. Wow. Yeah. On today's show, <laughs> hey. uh, on today's show we have Andy Stanford Clark, one of IBM's master inventors. Hi, Andy. Hi, Boris. Hey, Boris. <laughs> Andy is an expert in uh, software messaging and has applied his skills to all kinds of real world and virtual world prototypes. And he's especially famous in IBM for his unusual farm at the ho his home in the Isle of Wight, which I hope he's going to tell us some more about later. Um, and he also features in the most watched video in the virtual uh, in in the virtual business center in our innovation center. Andy, uh, welcome to the show. Thanks, Boris. Uh, great to be here on the uh, the first episode of the Boris in Wonderland. I must say it's a very fetching jump you're wearing there. Not quite as cool as my T-shirt, but uh, there you go. Uh, hey, I, I need to go shopping. I think I think you're right, but uh, it's the best I could do in the time. So, uh, right, fair enough. Andy, okay. let's get straight to the point. Um, what first uh, drew your attention to virtual worlds in the first place? How did you get into all this stuff? Well, I was in at the beginning of the um, the real internet, the internet that we know and love, back in the uh, the, the mid '90s, and round about then there was some technology that we were playing with that we kind of thought was going to be really important in the future, but at the time we weren't quite sure why. Um, so, you know, a whole load of us got together and started playing with this stuff, and it turned out to be the internet. So, you know, we kind of picked a winner on that one, and this. We've been watching immersive worlds for a while, but uh, suddenly when Second Life came along, there's a, a level of sophistication where suddenly we thought, you know, I think there's something here that might be big in the future. So that exact same feeling came around again sort of 10 years later. Uh, so I thought it was worth a look, and uh, we've been uh, dabbling in the world and trying out some uh, technologies, and uh, this could well be the next big thing. Yeah. So, uh, so on that note, then you, you know you're an expert in some of uh, IBM's kind of what you might call industrial strength products. Um, so, what do you think needs to happen for these sort of fledgling virtual worlds to be taken taken seriously by business? You know, for example, transactions and security. Uh, two examples will be transactions and security. But I think the main thing is <laughs> to have the ability to host the servers inside corporate intranets and have the ability to um, federate the servers so that you can move seamlessly between elements of a virtual world but have your own private spaces so that you can do things like confidential discussions or uh, things that are safe from prying eyes. Um, the, the whole notion of identity is very important as well because you know, we're, we're hiding behind these um, avatar names and yet so much of real life business is based on the, you know, the, the trust and actual knowledge of who it is you're actually talking to. So I think one of the limitations of Second Life at the moment is the, um, the pretty much enforcing of the separation between first life names and second life names. I think it's actually a, a hindrance rather than a help. By the way, that is a really nice jumper. <laughs> Thank you very much, and uh, I think uh, I think yours is uh, lives up to your name. Uh, uh, Andy's name uh, in Second Life is Ginger Mandelbrot. So we were just discussing before the show that uh, Mandelbrot, uh, Benoit Mandelbrot, still works for IBM actually. So uh, it's a very topical name and T-shirt. So Andy, um, I also Thank you. I'm glad you mentioned. Uh, I was rather hoping you would. <laughs> um, uh, we just uh, I was having a look around Second Life before, and I believe you have your own. Uh, House in modelled in Second Life. Uh, what's the, what's the story behind that? Well, while you talk, by the way, I'm going to uh, queue up a little uh, video for the viewers at home so they can see what we're talking about. Okay, cool. Um, so I've got a home automation system in my house at home uh, in in real life, and I thought it'd be quite cool to experiment with some of the interworld messaging technologies I'm working on to um, enable some of the features of my home automation system to be reflected in the virtual world. And I had a very talented student working with me uh, last year, a guy called Mark Alexander. And um, I said, could you go and build a little mock-up of my house so we can put like the, the lights and the, the fan and the uh, fountain and stuff into it? And uh, being something of a perfectionist, and it turns out to be quite a good uh, 
a prim wrangler in terms of building stuff in Second Life, uh, he went completely to town and built a completely photorealistic <laughs> scale model of my house uh, in Second Life, which took a very long time, but was well worth the effort because it's now completely, you know, very, very, very bizarre for me to walk around my virtual house noticing things like it's not dusty and there are no cups and saucers on the side and stuff. Um, it never gets old. Um, and yes, all the home automation stuff that I'm used to at home also works reflected in Second Life. So if I turn on my lights in First Life, my uh, Second Life house lights up. And if I turn off my fountain in Second Life, my real fountain in my garden turns off. Wow, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so that's really enabled us to try out um, a lot of the asset, uh, aspects of uh, near real-time messaging between the virtual worlds and look at things like latency and um, messages not being delivered and you know, what the, uh, some of the semantics are of things. One interesting thing that came up was that um, I got a bit annoyed by people turning my lights on and off in the middle of the night when they were playing around <laughs> in Second Life in other time zones. Uh, as you can imagine, um, so I actually it, it, that led me. It was a, you know, a, a requirement, a real-world requirement that led me to develop uh, what I term um, uh, identity-based routing, which or identity-based routing for our American friends, which enables me to uh, route a message through the messaging fabric um, according to um, the identity of the person who sent it. So that means that when I turn off my lights in my cottage. My real lights turn off, but when somebody else does it, it doesn't actually come and turn off my lights. It turns off the uh, light in our demo lab here in Hursley. So we're able to make routing decisions based on the identity of the sender, which is very, very powerful and obviously has lots of apl up applications. That's, that's pretty amazing stuff. Um, I'm just showing uh, the viewers at home a couple of other pictures uh, I took. Uh, one is of, uh, let, let, let's uh, talk about your llamas to start with, because you're, you're pretty famous in IBM for having this llama farm. So what, what's the story there? Uh, so my wife runs a llama, tre llama trekking business on the Isle of Wight here in the UK. And um, we'd, we'd said a number of times that it'd be really good to know uh, where the llamas were when they're out on a trek. Uh, so that we could have a sort of Google Maps mashup of uh, you know where the, track the trek, so see where the llamas are. And if one of them escaped, then we could use the sort of GPS tracking to locate them, so we could uh, get them back uh, into the field and so on. Um, so this led me down a whole alleyway of investigation of producing a miniaturised, ruggedized, long battery life tracking device, which is you know, small enough and strong enough to to to, uh, to go around a llama's neck, um, and obviously cracking that problem um, and some of the engineering challenges that that faced has led us to look at various aspects of the technology which were heavily applicable to lots of other tracking applications like vehicles, uh, an other animals, children, um, parcels uh, and, and so on. So uh, it's been what turned out was initially a sort of fairly frivolous activity to track the track um, actually turned out to be a rather interesting avenue of research. Wow. wow. So you, you certainly have a well, I, I don't know. I, I guess it's either an interesting life or a, a sort of, you say like the uber geek in IBM as well, so depending on, depending <laughs> on, the, on your point there. So. <laughs> um, the, the other yeah, well, I'm happy for us with those titles, was, that's fine. <laughs> the other thing I found, Andy, was um, uh, this uh, interesting looking clock, um, which again, the viewers at home can see now. So what, what's the story behind that? outside of your house in second life. Ah, yes. So I'm glad you mentioned that. That's called the time frame. Now, for ages I had this idea that it would be a really cool thing to have in your garden. It would be, um, can, can everyone see that it's on, on the screen? Yeah. Um, yeah. The idea would be it would be about something that was um, two or three metres long by about a metre wide. And it would be made up of wooden slats that kind of click over, go click, 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 make a nice sort of slapping noise as they go over, a very sort of peaceful sort of sound. And... Um, it serves two purposes. One is that it's a sort of relaxing sort of Japanese water garden type of idea. Um, and, and the other thing is that um, if you, people never know when their, ho their house gets photographed for Google Earth, but with this, um, because it's the, it actually represents the time, um, you'd have a barcoded encoding of the time whenever <laughs> Google Earth flew over your house. That's the secondary value of it. And what it is, it's simply a binary encoding of the Unix clock. So it's the number of seconds since 1st of January 1970 uh, encoded as ones and zeros. And uh, if, you, if you sit and watch it for long enough, you see these tremendous rollovers of a whole load of zeros turning into ones or ones turning into zeros, and the next bit flips over. 
and then it just starts again from one. So it's it's, it's incredibly sort of uh, nihilistic in some ways and incredibly powerful in other ways. But of course, what it also foretells is the time when. Um, you know, in the year 2038, when uh, the, the world as we know will end, when Unix time rolls over and we'll have Y2K more than, more than in spades, and obviously the, the, the time frame then will uh, go up in smoke or something. Um, anyway, so to answer the question that just popped up, I, I, I prototype this in Second Life um, because it's actually quite hard to build in First Life to convince myself if this was as cool an idea as I thought, and it absolutely is, there's no question. So I'm now turning my attention to building a physical model of this um, in First Life, and, and if anyone wants to buy one, I'm sure they'll be on sale at some point. Well, I'm sure there's, uh, you're reaching the right audience of Uber geeks here who might actually want a, a uh, binary based. <laughs> I'm getting uh, the office rolling in as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> viewing on GitHub. So, are there any other? I mean, that that's all pr all pretty amazing to me. So, are there any other interesting uh, virtual world projects you're allowed to share with us before the IBM uh, police come in? <laughs> um. Well, I have been talking to uh, a few industrial partners who want to uh, get involved in modeling in Second Life. We've been talking to some mining companies in Australia who would like to, mon to monitor and manage the mining operations uh, through the safety and uh, comfort of, second, of, of an immersive world without having to actually be out in the middle of nowhere um, running dangerous operations. So there's some interesting discussions there. And also some discussions with uh, some military partners who would like to run battlefield scenarios in virtual worlds, um, getting feedback uh, to and from uh, the real world to just play out various sort of war game type scenarios with um, sort of second generation sensors and wireless networks. So the, a lot of exciting stuff happening, but all linked together with this inter-world messaging fabric mess technology that I've been working on. So, so how do we sign up for that? That sounds pretty exciting. <laughs> uh, watch this space, I guess, at this point. <laughs> okay, okay. Now, uh, other than your T-shirt, I'm putting you on the spot here, so don't worry if you if you haven't got anything uh, interesting. But um, uh, I've been asking guests um, during rehearsals, and I want to ask uh, each guest that comes on, you know, if they've picked up anything kind of cool or funny or whatever that's uh, clean, this is a family show, uh, that you'd be prepared to share with our audience today. So are we expecting people to type questions? Uh, no, I, I was wondering if you, sorry Andy, uh, I was wondering if you had anything in your inventory that you'd picked up along the way that you'd be prepared to share with us today. Oh right, <laughs> ah right, okay. Um, I got some pretty bizarre dance routines once at a BBC party, and um, uh, that would be uh, sort of flashing nice. Uh, but I've also got a rather cool parachute that um, I've recently been given, so uh, perhaps I should uh, dig that out. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure what good. happens have if I can put that on. Uh, oh, oh, hell, oh, gosh. <laughs> uh, oh, I think you're sitting on it. <laughs> no, not sure that worked. This okay, now TV what happens? Folks, so what happens now? Hang on a minute. <laughs> oh. Are you able to pull the ripcord? Oh. Bit of bit of jumping going on there. <laughs> Oh, it didn't come down that time. Did that work? Oh, he's gone. <laughs> come back. Okay, we appear to have lost our guest, and seeing his uh, voice is spatial in Second Life, uh, I think we've lost him for good. So, <laughs> um, oh, well, on that note, I will uh, conclude this episode of Boris in Wonderland. Tune in next time. Thanks for joining. And uh, thanks for. Oh. Thanks. Well, that was I'm a bit of a disaster. Up, so, uh, um, we'll, uh... <laughs> <laughs> I was just wrapping up, so uh, what am I... thanks for joining, Andy. <laughs> My pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'll, I'll try sitting down again. Hang on. <laughs> here we go. Great to be on the show. I hope everyone's enjoyed it. And uh... Yeah, much appreciated. Thanks for joining, and uh, uh, tune in next time.